Another interesting measure is to look at the olfactory ball volume. What you see here is the, the brain from bottom up. Actually, here would be the eye bulbs, and just above the eye bulbs, you have the olfactory bulbs. This is actually the, the olfactory center in our brain, the olfactory bulb. It's not very like a small bone. It's like um, 1 in 1.5 centimeters long and, and 1 centimeter in diameter. It's not a very large thing. And this is our olfactory center. You may say it's not very large. But in the rat, it's also the same size. So, and rats, olfactory sensors now works very well. So it's, our olfactory bulb is compared to the rat and compared to the dog. It's not bad. Uh, so this is actually our center for the sense of smell. What's interesting here is that this actually changes over time. It changes when you lose your sense of smell. This is shown here. This is the olfactory bulb volume in healthy people. And this is the olfactory bulb volume in people who have lost their sense of smell. So what this shows you is when you lose a sense of smell, your olfactory bulb shrinks. And when you regain your olfactory function, olfactory bulb grows again. And this is what they can see clinically. It's also another example about plasticity in the olfactory system. So you have lots of plasticity there. Plasticity means when you think at the periphery about the olfactory receptors in the nasal cavity, they are constantly turned over. So while you sit here, while you listen to me, you lose olfactory receptors and new receptors are regrown. So that every four months or so, you have a complete new sheet of olfactory receptors up in your nasal cavity. And similar things are happening at the level of the olfactory bulb. In the olfactory bulb, you also have a constant exchange of neurons. There are constantly neurons flowing into the olfactory bulb. They come from a certain zone in the midbrain and they're replacing other neurons in the olfactory bulb. And that's related to activation. So when you sniff a lot, when your olfactory sense is good, then your olfactory bulb is very large. And when you don't sniff much, or when you lose the sense of smell, your olfactory bulb shrinks. So that's a very interesting parameter for us clinically, because it also tells us something about plasticity of the brain as such. So it's also the olfactory system can be used for other things as well. This is not, this is actually a hoax here. It's, it's not the outcome of surgery in our clinic, so just be assured. What, how frequent is olfactory loss? It's frequent. So, as I told you in the beginning, age is a major factor of olfactory loss. When you look at the general population, 5% do not have olfactory function, meaning every 20th person does not smell a thing. That's a lot. When it comes to decreased olfactory function, the numbers are up to 20%. About 20% of the general population do not smell very well. So it's a, a, quite a large figure. What are the the causes of that, one of the major causes is called here sinonasal. That means nasal polyps or chronic sinusitis, you know, a blocked nose. That's the um, or allergies that are behind that. These are three quarters of that of causes of the olfactory, of olfactory loss. Then you have upper respiratory tract infections. This may be acute infections like a flu or, or a cold that you catch. It may wipe out the sense of smell completely. This is what we see in people who are older than 50 years and mostly in, more in women than in men. Then, of course, the trauma, head trauma can kill your sense of smell. It's mostly when you fall to the back of the head, then very often we would see a, dec a complete loss of the sense of smell, and there are other causes of that. The recovery rates, they are, are for cyanonasal disease, I'll come back to that later, it can be treated quite well. For upper respiratory tract infections, recovery rates are in the range of 60%, meaning 60% get better over the years, 40% are never reach affective function again. When it comes to post-traumatic affective loss, like 20% um, get better, 80% never reach affective function anymore. Another cause of affective loss may be Parkinson's disease, and this has been established over the last 10 years. Also see similar things in Alzheimer's, but what's interesting in Parkinson's disease that you, you know this disease, it's probably you have seen somebody, it's a very typical disorder, you see people become very stiff and they, they look like this, and they move like so, uh, so steps and they have no, no the facial expression sort of, oh, this is, this is no longer there. It's a terrible disease. You know, it makes these people also have a tremor, they tremble all the time. Imagine that you want to have a, eat an egg when you have this tremor, you know, you throw your egg away. It's, you actually, you starve in front of your egg, if you, if you will. So it's a it's very terrible disease because these people, they are mentally sane. You know, they have no mental problem. It's just their motor functions become totally out of order. What's interesting here is that the sense of smell is decreased in people with Parkinson's disease about four to five years before onset of the motor symptoms. 
So it's a very early symptom of Parkinson's disease, which may also allow to treat Parkinson's disease earlier than we used to. Of course, it does mean when you have an olfactory loss that it will lead to Parkinson's disease, but you can use it diagnostically very well. So can, you can, if you look at people who have signs for Parkinson's disease with a normal sense of smell, you should already investigate the diagnosis. So it's, it's more than 94% of patients with Parkinson's disease do have an olfactory loss. What are the complaints about in people who have lost a sense of smell? Of course, there's much of it is uh, food-related. Many people complain about um, problems with cooking, appetite, that they had uh, problems with spoiled foods, that they don't perceive body odors anymore, that they shower very often just because of this insecurity, that you do not know how their own body odor is. Uh, and depression is a major factor here. There are more than two-thirds of people with a loss of sense of smell who become depressed showing how important the sense of smell is for our lives. You know, in the beginning, I tried to make the point that hearing and vision is much more important than, than the sense of smell. Of course, that is so. But the sense of smell has important implications for our lives, and that our mood is one of them, and depression is, is a major factor here. You can see that women are more depressed than men when you look at it with various questionnaires about quality of life. Women are more... Um, more of a problem, loss of sense is more of a problem for women than it is for men. You see it also for the back depression inventory. Um, when it comes to body weight, the, the picture is a little bit different. I've talked a lot about our sense of smell and eating, but now the question is, what would you think when people lose their sense of smell? Lose they also, do they lose body weight? Do they gain body weight? Does it do the same? What would you think? Do they lose? Who would be for lose and gain? And stay the same? And stay the same is right. <laughs> it's actually it's an interesting thing. Actually, only 10% of patients with olfactory or loss lose, their, lose body weight. And more of them, 20%, gain body weight. Why is that so? Because they change diets. People who have lost their sense of smell, they no longer they don't perceive much from daily food. So they start to eat sweet things. After, for instance, after, after they had dinner with the families, they start to have uh, like a the sweet dessert, which they did not used to have before with a normal sense of smell. Another thing is that uh, the sense of smell is also involved in appetite or regulation. So in each and every one of us, when we have eat, when we eat, let's say, bananas. So you eat two bananas and then you're fed up with bananas. So you, and then, but then you can continue, continue with chocolate until you fed up with chocolate. And then you can switch to cucumbers or whatnot. So it's, it's a, called sensory specific satiety. And that's, affection plays a role in there. And people who have lost a sense of smell, they actually also probably, they, they miss this satiety feeling, and so they overeat a little bit. And over time, it produces an increase in body weight. Also, when it comes to sexuality, we looked at that question and asked our patients about the um, where they perceive a decrease of sexual drive. There are a few examples of patients who express this very loudly, that they say as soon as they lost the sense of smell, their, their sexual appetence goes down, and so it's, it's, for, for them it's a real problem. So we asked a larger group of our patients, approximately 100 people, and what we found here is that olfactory loss does not really produce a decrease of sexual drive, but it produces depression, and depression decreases, it produces a decrease in sexual desire. So it's mediated by depression. That's the major factor here. It's not that, that it's not a direct correlation between sexual appetence and uh, your affective functions. How to treat olfactory loss? So I'm um, gradually approaching protein. The end here is one, of course, you can do surgery. Um, that's when it comes to sinus nasal disease. When people have polyps in their noses or they have chronic sinusitis, you can uh, cut out those polyps and you can open the sinuses. And, it's helpful in some patients, but not in all. Um, there's, you can do systemic drugs like corticosteroids, they're anti-inflammatory, very helpful in many people. But when it comes to the olfactory system, then it's a problem there because to get up this uh, corticosteroids through the olfactory cleft, because the, if you use a spray, then the spray gets stuck here in the anterior third of the nasal cavity. It does not go up because the nasal cavity is a filter. And so, so it filters out the sprays easily, and nothing of that spray actually reaches the olfactory cleft where the olfactory receptors are. So theoretically, they could help, but practically, it's an issue. Other approaches, they involve acupuncture, for instance. There are various trials here. I don't want to go into details. There's 
vitamins have been tried in also in unblinded studies. Uh, there's pentoxidin maybe of help, or theophylline, or coffee maybe even. Uh, one thing I would like to, to stretch a little bit more before I finish is olfactory training. So I guess so all of you are very well trained in olfactory with odors, and I trust that you are um, better than the rest of the population when it comes to odor thresholds, just because you do the training. There's, in the literature, you find a few reports that say when people are exposed repetitively to odors, they increase their olfactory function. There's been a few examples there. Also, this is what we did then with our patients. We put them on a very simple task. We had to, the task was for them to sniff those four odors, rose, lemon, eucalyptus, and cloves. Had to do that one morning and in the evening for six months. And what we found here is that it also works in patients. So patients who do the training, like uh, one quarter of them improves significantly in olfactory function. People who do not do the training, they do not improve that much to that degree. So it's also clinically very helpful. What's the effect behind? It's maybe a cognitive effect, so that your brain is better dealing with the signal. It also could be that in the periphery, that you grow more olfactory receptors or you grow more olfactory receptor neurons even. This is shown here in the data from animal research. So you see recordings from odor cells, from odor sensors. This is before training with those different odors. And this is after training with those odors. What you can see there is that the response increases, and that's an indicator that actually when you train your sense of smell, when you expose yourself repetitively to odors, this also seems to have an effect on your a number of smell cells in the nasal cavity, and also a number of receptors maybe on your in the nasal cavity. So it also may help in humans on, on, on that peripheral level. And with that, I'd like to thank my, my, my colleagues on different places of the planet, and uh, mostly my friends in, in Dresden, and would like to thank you, thank you.